Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. How precious it is. The Word that can change your life, that can give you purpose, that can give you strength, and strengthen faith whereby you stand against all the enemies of that that God would call righteous. So it's a powerful word, but it's encouraging and very rewarding in as much as those that participate within it receive the blessings of God. Those that just pray and never participate in it, they get nothing, zippo, nada. So it's important that you partake of our Father's word. That's why he has written the letter to you for you to gain by it. Otherwise, if you enjoy being a nobody, hey, no problem, have to it. So with that having been said, uh, by, that, by what do I mean by being a nobody? Never having your prayers answered. Some people, I just wonder why God doesn't answer my prayers. Because you don't ever do anything that he should answer your prayers. Every promise in God's word basically has an if involved to it. If you don't seem to absorb the ifs. You just expect a handout, a freebie. God doesn't operate that way. Sorry, there's only one thing, and intuitively that was given to you, and that's salvation if you participate. After that, you earn your rewards, and you earn your blessings from Him. Or, quite frankly, as you probably noticed, they don't exist if you haven't earned them. We that do earn them, he blesses us to pieces, and I thank him for that. Being a good servant is a wonderful thing. How do you be a good servant? You listen to his word. You absorb it, and you read it with understanding. That's the way it goes. Uh, so with that having been said, let's get back into the book of Luke. Luke means light giver. Luke was a medical doctor. Therefore, many of, much of his terminology is given... Um, oftentimes in medical terminology, which makes it, leaves a thumbprint to the writings of Luke, whereby a scholar knows instantly, hey, it's obvious who was the author of this particular book. This one carrying his name leaves nothing to uh, wonder. So we ask a word of wisdom from our Father. And Luke chapter uh, 22, verse 29, let's get into it. Let's set the stage just a little bit, just a little bit. The disciples now were called apostles. I mean, Christ allowed them to be called apostles now. No longer students, but sent ones. Do you know what? They immediately got the big head. They began to argue among themselves which of them would be the greater. Got on a little ego trip. And anytime you allow that to happen in a group, you're going to have trouble. And then Christ explained that he, as far as greatness was concerned, he was certainly chiefest, but he had to serve them. He had to feed them. And that's what he expected his servants to do. That means you today are supposed to feed those that need the truth. And only our Father knows how badly truth is needed in the world today. I don't care how great you think you are, but you're supposed to be feeding, serving feeding the word, for as it is written in Amos chapter 8, the famine in the end times is not for bread, but for hearing the word of God. Teach it. So this is what he was telling them, and we pick it up just as he closed that thought with verse 29, and it reads, to the uh, apostles now they're called. And I appoint unto you a kingdom. I uh, covenant to you a kingdom. He does to you today. As my Father hath appointed unto me. That's a powerful statement. I don't know. Have you participated in it yet? Or do you like to be a nobody? I don't know. It's up to you. Think about it. Verse 30 that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom 
and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel and the rest of the world as far as that's concerned. You might say, you mean we judge? Well, it's written in the millennium that God's election shall participate in that. I don't, it's not something that I would relish, but it is written. Uh, God does the great white throne judgment. But what does this judgment mean in the fact of teaching, disciplining? And every good teacher should be a good disciplinarian to see that God's Word is taught boldly and straightforward. Do you want me to document that for you? As far as the eternity that you will be judges, that you will, it's written in the 44th chapter of Ezekiel, which is a millennium chapter, as to where not only will you judge, but that you will be given no inheritance in Israel because God Himself is your heritage. Boy, that is really something. Think about it. That's a very, then perhaps you can better understand why he says, I give you a king in his dominion. Just take a little home assignment of Ezekiel chapter 44. Begin reading and studying with about verse 25. Verse 31 to continue. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. He didn't call him Peter this time. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Um, it's more than desired. He's demanding. Satan wants to have him. There was a time when Christ said back at his temptation, and you'll remember in verse 28, he said, you are, you are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Satan tempted him up until he said, get behind me. That was final. That was the final and the last time he was locked and secured from temptation of Christ following that why he failed. But you'll find a prime example of this 31st verse in the great book of Job. Job, the word in the Hebrew means persecuted. And, and um, even as Satan, as you will read in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, how that he went before the throne of God with the other angel, Satan did. And God asked Satan, said, what, what do you think about my boy Job? Satan said, well, he's, he's doing real good and he's rich and all that, but then you've got a fence built around him till I can't get to him. Now listen carefully. You know, God will build a fence around you today in the power and the name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, that Satan cannot penetrate unless you let the wall down yourself. You will find that we, we've covered it right here in the great book of Luke in chapter 10, beginning with about verse 8 to 19. God, gave, through the Son, gives us powers over all of our enemies, even as he beheld Satan fall as a star from heaven. I don't know. How, how good are you at putting the wall up, God being the wall? But, but Satan says, if you'll take that wall down, I can have him eaten out of my hand. Those are my words, and the analogy is true, and it holds solid. And God said, okay, I'll take the wall down. You can do everything, but you can't have his life, meaning you can't kill him. And Satan did about everything but kill him. And then there were three good buddies showed up, and yakety, 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 for almost uh, 38 chapters, for about 30 chapters. I mean, they're giving that boy advice. And I've heard many preachers preach long sermons on the advice of those knuckleheads. Well, it's written in the Word. Yeah, but God said Himself in chapter 38, they were stupid, didn't know what they were talking about, and you preach a sermon on it? Finally, God said, why don't you listen to me? And that Job is a book that gets that point across. Why don't you listen to the Father? And if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. So Satan wanted to get to old Simon Peter. You know why? Because Simon would establish uh, the original church, that is to say the 120 that you will find gathered in the first chapter of Acts. 
And Satan wanted to get to him because he didn't want that church, he didn't want people grouping together in the name of Christ. That's why Satan wanted him and, and was demanding it of all the nerve, demanding it. And do you know something? If you amount to your salt today, Satan will be demanding to get to you. But you know what? You don't have to put the wall down. Only a person not in his right mind or not thinking would allow the wall to be down in the first place. Now continuing on so that you understand, he wants to sift him. Do you know how Satan wants to sift? He knows your every weakness. And he can sift them out and just zero in on you. And um, this is one reason you never want to get hooked on drugs or anything else. He's got that right on the top of the list because you're a sucker for it. Pass a little snort under your nose and you'll just follow Satan right to his den. You've got no willpower, no guts, no gumption, not too many smarts, and you're cooking the rest of them. I don't know, you're really a winner, aren't you? I don't really know why God would want you in the first place, perhaps, if you continue on that track, but he will make you new. So, you see, Satan wants to sift you because he knows your ever weakness. See that he doesn't touch it. I don't know. That's up to you. Hey, whatever you want to do, have a party if that's what you want. But know your father will pr always protect you and make something out of you. Don't let Satan sift you. Keep the wall up. Verse 32. I'm not saying anyone is perfect. But don't worry, Satan does know your weaknesses. 32, but I have prayed for thee. That's Christ himself prayed for thee that thou, thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. In other words, the word converted isn't as we think of it in English. It's recovered would be the... Uh, <clears throat> or maybe better yet, to revert. When you revert back to following me, because Christ knew he was going to stumble. I'm not too sure that he didn't stumble for our benefit. That is to say, so it is written that he did recover, that he did revert back to common sense, rather than denying that Christ was Messiah. He would do that. So, you always want to stay with the Word and in the Word and allow the Word to strengthen you because there's not all that much strength within ourselves. 33, and he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. I'm ready to die for you right now. And I'm sure Peter meant that from the very bottom of his heart. 34, and he said, Christ answering, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. You're going to deny three times that you don't even know me. I'm sure that broke Peter's heart. I don't know, we've got a time coming up when some of God's election are going to be delivered up before the Messiah. Do thoughts like that frighten you? They don't have to, shouldn't. You should be ready, willing, and able to follow him. And I suppose maybe Peter was worried this time, well, what will they think? Or will they try to crucify me too? I don't, you know, you've got to learn. It doesn't matter what people think. As long as you're doing the Father's work in the way it is written, verse 35. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. In other words, when I sent the 70 out, two by two, I told you not to take a begging bag or anything like that. And um, don't even take an extra coat. The people will take care of you. Did you lack anything? Meaning that Christ himself, through the Holy Spirit and the presence of God, protected them every step of their way and, and um, touched hearts whereby everything was provided for them. What he's saying here, if you have your faith in me, you don't have to worry about anything as long as you do your part. 
And that's very important. I hope you understand the last, if you do your part. If you don't, forget it, okay? But they, they admitted, oh, we, we, didn't, we didn't miss anything. We didn't miss a meal. We, we lack nothing. Verse 36, then said he unto them, but now he that hath the purse, let him take it. And likewise is script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. <laughs> you may, you're going to need it without faith, is what he's saying here. But you know what sword you really want to buy, beloved? You could even trade your old clothing in for new clothing, that's to say the gospel armor, and carry the sword of the Lord, which is his word. It cuts deep. Verse 37. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. In other words, uh, if the hourglass is tipped, the sand soon runs out. And we're coming in in the second uh, dispensation, even to that same time. Um, he's quoting here from the 53rd uh, chapter of Isaiah, and, and we're going to go there. I want to read it to you. You're not going to have it on your screen. It's Isaiah 53, verse 11, all right? In verse 53, 11, 12 will be what Christ was quoting. It's going to happen. It's going to happen that way. And I read verse 11 of Isaiah 53. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. By his what? By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. He's going to bear their sins. Why? With his, by his blood on the cross. We know that. But now, the thing is, how, by what does he do this by knowledge? I don't know. Have you picked up on any of it? Have you got yours? Want to throw a little pop test here and let me check you out and see how much of his knowledge you have? Or might that embarrass you? Verse 12 of uh, Isaiah 53. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. I don't know. I don't know. How, how are you doing? How strong are you, spiritually speaking? I don't, I'm not talking about physical strength. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, this is what Christ was quoting. He said, this has got to come to pass. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. In other words, you don't have to worry about a coat or a purse or script doing his work. He will take care of it. He will intercede. He is the intercessor. And know this, you can trust him. He'll, he will take real good care of you. Do you know why? It's real simple. I don't know why, but he loves you. You know, sometimes before you come around and get your act together, it's pretty hard, I guess, maybe to love some people with the shape they allow themselves to get into. But he does love you. I don't care what shape you're in. And if you come back around, if you revert, he, he will bless you. He certainly will. <clears throat> and you know something? The person that was working in the vineyard at the close of the day received the same salary as one in the beginning. So that's a pretty, pretty good uh, deal for somebody that hadn't amounted anything yet. But you could. Think about it. So then we continue. That's where that he was quoting this. Now, I want you to fix in your mind, he's about to be crucified, about to be delivered up. Do you think he didn't know it? He quoted a scripture that said, stated, point blank, that he would die for many. And even that he would be 
crucified among the transgressors. That's to say those thieves and robbers that were on the cross on each side of him, 38, back in Luke 22. And they said, Lord, behold, here, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. But you know what he really said? Remember, they, here they were asking which one of them is the greatest. He's enough of this. He was kind of putting them on a little bit, but I hope that you can see through it and, and understand. They're, they're, I mean, they're ready to do battle. They're confused, but perhaps they were confused so that perhaps you could see yourself today in this generation when so much needs to be done and you're not quite sure what it is even though he makes it clear and, and speaks in such a way that anyone can understand you're going to be delivered up before the false messiah and he wants to use you that you're to prepare yourself mentally, physically, uh, spiritually that you can cut the mustard, that you can be a can-do type person. And some will still say, I just wonder what it is that I'm to do. Are you supposed to carry a sword to win that battle? Absolutely not. You're supposed to have it here, right, but right, in, you know, right in this old forehead. That's where your brain is. You're supposed to have the seal of God there. That's to say his word. Is it or isn't it? I know one thing I know you know. It isn't that you have to, rem you have to memorize the entire word as a, as a teacher must practically do, but you have to at least know the flow of his plan whereby it is embedded in your brain, mind, whereby you know that that is happening for after all he has foretold us all things in his word. I don't know. How are you doing? my good and faithful servant, fellow servant in the Lord's work. How are you doing? Christ finally got disgusted with them and said, enough of this. I mean, uh, and um, so, so that you would know today, when you don't line up, he gets tired of messing with you. But anytime you call on him to revert or to convert, he'll be there, don't worry. He'll mess with you then, 39. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him, probably Bethany on the west slope of the mount. 40. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. He had a little chore to do. He said, just, just uh, try to think and not enter into weakness. Verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. Well, how far is the stone's cast? Well, I don't know. I guess it's according to who's casting it, but about that far. He kneeled down, 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, there's a lot of poor little old revolving revs say right here, oh, he is the cup of death he wants to pass. That's not what he was talking about. He had just stated and quoted the scripture that stated what he must do. He has told us in this same uh, chapter that he was anxious to get on with it. And you would have the audacity to say, this was the cup? You know, what cup is mentioned in God's Word? The cup of God's wrath at His second advent. Have you never read in the, uh, what is it, the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation where it says that old harlot Babylon, you know who she is, she's the one that's deceived by the false Christ and he said, that cup that she tried to pass off on you when she said, I said a queen, not a widow. In other words, she accepted the first Christ that came pretending, pertaining to the second advent, which was the false one. He said, fill that old cup up to her double and make her drink it, every drop of it. And it's not going to be easy on those that allow themselves to be deceived. 
it is so terrible that Christ was saying, if it's possible, is there another way that we can bring in the second advent without the cup of the dregs, the cup of trembling? That is to say, God's wrath on this earth. Don't forget, God's a jealous God. And when Satan deceives most of his children, he's going to be angry at both Satan and the children. Do you know where that cup is? Do you know we just read chapter 51? I'm sorry, 53. We're going to go to 51. I, I don't want you to ever forget about that cup. But Christ said, nevertheless, beside that, if there's not another way, your will be done. And I can assure you, it will be done God's way. No, he wasn't frightened. And it was not the cup of his crucifixion that he was trying to pass. Listen to the cup it was, Isaiah 51, verse 22. Thus uh, saith thy Lord, the Lord and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people, those that are true. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. Never again is that old heifer, the sister Babylon, going to try to pass off any uh, statements, actions, or anything to the contrary as it's written in Revelation 18. The cup goes in the Lord's hand. Your Lord. Verse 20. But I will put it into the hand of them that afflict me, thee, which have said to thy soul, bow down, that we may go over. And thou hast laid thy body as the ground and as the street to them that went over. And I'm through with it. Through of the time of coming as, as offering salvation, but coming as king of kings with a rod of iron and a cup of fury. Christ was saying, is there any other way? But it doesn't matter, Father. Your will be done. And you can rest assured it will come to pass as it's written, where will you be? For all these events, as we discovered in chapter 21 and documented, will come to pass in and to this generation. It's never too late, friend, to get into the Word. Verse 43. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Uh, invigorating him. He didn't need any strength. Invigorating him. 44, and being in an agony. You know what this word is in the Greek? Acute anxiety. He's ready. All right? Just the opposite of what many English readers would translate this or teach it. He prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. You know, he loves the people even when they mess up royally. Man, it's difficult for a human man to understand that, how he could love some of the nuts that we've got in this world today and what they do to themselves and to other people. But he does. He didn't want to cup, pour that cup out on them. Want to know if there was another way. But there's only one language they understand. And it's the cup, and they're going to get it. But as he's praying and asking, anxious, 45, and when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, they're not called God, apostles here, disciples, that means students, he found them sleeping for sorrow. You know, a little slumber, a little while, and... The body is weak, and I mean, at a time like this, when he is on the eve of being delivered up, the so-called Last Supper, ga -ga -ga -ga, finished, completed, they're sleeping. Let me tell you something. Don't you ever dare go to sleep on watch, but rather watch, watchman, watch. I hope you understand I'm speaking of a spiritual sleep.
For as it is written in Romans chapter 11, many are going to receive the spirit of slumber, all right, directly from God. But that's meant for those that are, are biblically illiterate and uh, might, if they had a little knowledge, be too stupid to do anything about it. And I know I'm calling names, but it's the actual gospel truth. Read Romans 11. See that you don't fall under that veil of slumber. It's called stupor in the Greek. Verse 46. And said unto them, Why sleep ye, question? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And I would say that to you today as well, beloved. You need to pray and see that you're not tempted to by anything that comes forth that might deceive you. And how do you double check? How do you make a list and how do you check it twice? You do it by using the word of God, not the words of some man, this man or any other man. But you check it out according to God's word because as it is written, that's exactly how it shall come to pass. Verse 47. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. Oh, boy. And do you know it was written that a friend would betray him? Yes, even that. 48. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? In other words, a, a, a sign of love turns into a sign of treachery. And it still is even to this day. Do you know what it's called? A Judas kiss. 49. When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? I mean, that's human nature. You know, they've come to take him. And, and yeah, and this wasn't a Roman army. It was a bunch of, of um, religious uh, deacons with sticks and brooms and one good warrior, one good Marine or soldier could have taken out the whole bunch. I mean, it, was, it wouldn't have been any step for a stepper to have, to have defeated the whole bunch. And he, here he's preached to them and told them that this moment must come. But it's just human nature, and that's all right. That's all right. You want us to get the sword to them, and they could have scattered them, 15. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Bam. Now, we know from another gospel that this was Peter. And um, <laughs> that's right. The old boy that would deny him thrice. He was ready to do battle and did battle. And this was the old high priest's number one modo right out there in the sticks trying to gather him in. But that that is written must come to pass, 51. Now, now let me, lest any of you might misunderstand by my saying probably, I have no doubt uh, being a military person that his, the 12 could have taken the whole bunch of them because they, they were not Roman soldiers. They were deacons, all right? So that, that uh, of the church, so it wouldn't be, it, they're pushovers, all right? Uh, most of them, and you got some good deacons, all right? We'll have to say that. But uh, it would have been no problem. But the main thing is that all he would have had to have done was called a whole army of angels that could have just blown them away. That's the point. I want you to know that he intended to allow it to happen. So the ear is cut off. It's dangling there. The blood is flying. What does he do? 51. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. It's enough of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Just like that. Boy, you know, if I'd have been one of those deacons in the front row there when that took place, I would have probably said, whoa-ha. Verse 52. That's not what they have on their mind, though. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders, 
which were come to him, um, again, emphasizing not Roman soldiers, but your religious nuts, appointed by a Roman governor, yes. These are his words. Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves, meaning sticks. 53. When I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness, meaning it's time for Satan's hour to come to pass. Well, beloved, there is another hour approaching. It's called the hour of temptation. You're going to be tempted. And he's preparing many of these, I, I do believe, that many of the things that happened to the disciples that uh, really is a shame to them is so that you do, so that you yourself do not allow it to happen to you that you're prepared and that you're ready by that I mean to serve as it is written concerning the gospel armor the delivering up the testimony the Holy Spirit speaking through you you can cut it because you have the Spirit of God in you. You have the Word of God in your mind whereby you know that that is written will come to pass and you see it come to pass daily even now. So be ready to serve Him. And do not let confusion come into your life at a point that is a benchmark meaning a change of motion in the end actually showing itself to you, don't get over anxious, overheated. Serve. You'll have time to get excited later. Be cool and be a servant of the Most High God. So we'll pick this up in the next lecture and um, if I were you, I wouldn't miss it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?